Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning, good evening. Um, welcome um, all of you from all over the world to this is the Centre for Global Higher Education seminar number webinar 242. I'm David Mills, I'm Deputy Director, and um, I'm delighted to be introducing today our two speakers, Dr. Ye Liu from King's College and Dr. Wen Qing Chen from Peking University, China. Their title is Building Halos, How Do Chinese Elites Seek Distinction Through Miss Brackets, Recognizing Studying Abroad? And I think this is a really important topic and a topic that um, will, will, will reveal a lot about the ways in which um, generations of Chinese students have sought, sought prestige through study. So um, our presenters, um, Ye Liu is a senior lecturer at King's College and she's worked on education and gender, the legacies of one child policy in China. And she's the author of Higher Education Meritocracy and Inequality in China. And Wen Chin Shen is Associate Professor of Higher Education at Peking University. And his research focuses on higher education systems, drawing on sociology of science, philosophy of science, and has published a lot on the transnational histories and ideas of liberal education in China and the UK, as well as academic mobility and doctoral um, career trajectories. So before I hand over to them, there's a few um, housekeeping points for those of you who might be new to this seminar series. Um, the webinar is being recorded and um, therefore please um, be aware of that. We will be asked to um, you, you, this will be available tomorrow and you will um, therefore have to um, um, so, uh, just note that and then in terms of um, participating we ask you to remain um, mute um, with your with your um, speaker off and your video you can turn on at the point when you ask questions please do um, contribute to the conversation through, through using the chat function and um, you can also use the speaker view to see the speaker um, during the, during this week. And the, the speakers are going to speak for about half an hour, and then there's lots of time for questions and conversation. And then more ado, I'll now hand over to the um, speakers. Um, building halos. It's it's the, the screen's yours. Thank you very much, Wenchin and Yilu. Thank you so much, David, for kind of. Thank you, Adele. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Excellent. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's our pleasure to be here today to share our research. Uh, we're just going straight to diving to our research. Um, we're going to have a kind of traditional a script before a research presentation. We're going to explain, talk a little bit about why we did this research. I'm going to highlight some gaps in existing literature on um, international students and Chinese elites. I'm going to talk about our data then we will uh, share our findings, why we uh, uh, frame this research as building triple halos. And first of all, let's talk about Chinese students. We all know international higher education university everywhere in all, in a lot of countries, Canada, Australia, US, UK, have put a lot of spin on Chinese international students. Chinese international students uh, sometimes portrayed as ca cash cows and for the economic um, st stability for the particularly during the uncertainty during the COVID Chinese students also caught between the really uncertain geopolitical circumstances um, since the pandemic but now we need to step back and ask a question who set the trend to study abroad. So who is a trendsetter? Given you know, the recent unstable, unpredictable, volatile social political, geopolitical circumstances, we need to ask this question, whether Chinese students are still keen to study abroad. So existing literature, we have a, a volume large volume research on Chinese international students. Um, study abroad literature has been really rich in terms of unpacking the students' social uh, economic backgrounds and the, the concept of mobility as a capital was really powerful in terms of uh, uh, giving this, uh, highlighting the privilege associated with mobility. However, most of the literature uh, on study abroad focus on the students who already successfully make that transition abroad. And we don't know um, 
you know, the culture that sponsored or that led to this kind of a trend of studying abroad. On the other hand, we have we also have a lot of very interesting studies on elite students, particularly uh, from the US and the study on uh, Oxford and uh, CM Paul in France about elite students' aspirations and impact on their transition to the labor market. But we have this gap here. Why do Chinese elite graduates want to study abroad? And how do they construct this narrative of distinction? So we have no Chinese, uh, uh, particularly culture at least, has a long tradition of studying abroad. We have Chen Zhongshu who studied in Oxford, and we have Ju Jimo who studied in Cambridge. So uh, they were literary legends. But why contemporary elites still consider study abroad as attractive pathway to distinction? So we're going to just um, talk briefly uh, about the theoretical and conceptual framework which inspired our research. So first, of course, the Baudier's uh, uh, theory of cultural capital and distinction. And we also draw our research um, from socio sociology of distinction making, such as uh, emulation and recognition, particularly by uh, uh, Michelle Lamont, her work on uh, dis dis distinction making by different social class in the US and in France. And we consider emulation as a process of continuing up in the spending game by developing expansive, elaborate taste, in other words, outreach of others. Recognition and misrecognition was a process of legitimizing the value and prestige of certain cultural habits. At the same time, most importantly, denying access recognition to others. And we, uh, our theoretical framework, also conceptual framework, also inspired by the feminist philosopher Sally Haslanger's three uh, sequential approach to conceptualize distinction in the Chinese uh, context. So why is the culture capital so attractive in China? So we have, you know, the, the theories developed from Western contexts, particularly from Pierre Bautier, on different forms and convertibility of capital, very, uh, you know, informative and also very useful to make sense of cultural capital con con convertibility of different types of capital in the Chinese context. Um, so I just want to highlight a little bit of background information about elite opportunity pathways in China. So during the market of transition, Chinese uh, party elites captured premier access to new economic uh, opportunities and, and transformed themselves into a cooperational elites. And there is another set of uh, elite formations called bottom up entrepreneurs decoupled from the party members supply of state enterprises and amassed wealth during the market transition. However, market transition period was swept by another uh, phase we called education-based meritocracy where party, even party elites, political elites seek to legitimize their positions through credentials through part, very systematic party schools and also through academic degrees. Um, just give you a, a very interesting example. This is a data from China um, a lab, we, uh, which is a, a very sophisticated a data source on China's political elites. And you can see the 19th um, Politburo Standing Committee level uh, members and their level of education. So traditionally, so the uh, party members, party elites ed educated from the party school, but since the last two decades, party members, particularly those in the party leadership still seek academic uh, credentials and some got PhDs and current president Xi Jinping had a PhD from Tsinghua University. Um, and also, 
entrepreneurial elites and corporational elites also seek educational credentials. The current, just to give you a very uh, uh, relevant example, um, Meng Wanzhou, the, uh, Meng Wanzhou, the deputy um, Huawei CEO, recently caught between the recent China and uh, Canada uh, diplomatic role. And when she was arrested and she said, I will do a PhD. Okay, by, by articulating this idea of doing a PhD, and she associated herself of her legitimacy as, you know, uh, as merit-based entrepreneur, merit-based um, corporational elites, rather than the traditional elites from, you know, breeded from uh, Napoleon. So it's coach capital is very attractive in the in the Chinese context, and because of the culture capital conveniently conceal, legitimize the power privilege of political elites and corporational elites, and also because of China's deeply rooted uh, ideology of meritocracy, become this kind of gives us a brilliant culture of importance of a degree. But having said that, we need to also need to talk about why studying abroad? Why you least need to study abroad to justify it, to up the game of distinction. So we choose uh, Peking University, Beijing, Beida as a case study and just to, to unpack the mechanisms that produces culture of studying abroad, particularly by elite students and how they author a distinctive language of distinction, which includes certain type of, of candidates and deliberately fend off the challenges of the others. So now I'm going to hand over to Wen Qing and he's going to talk, Professor Sheng is going to talk about uh, our research design um, and talk about our, uh, the findings from uh, a survey study. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Um, I will talk about the uh, research design because our study is a mis, uh, we use a mis method. Um, the study include a quantitative and qualitative uh, session. And the qualitative uh, part is already published in studies in higher education. Um, and the qualitative research is still uh, under review. And uh, the, uh, the questionnaire survey was uh, uh, sent out in 2017. And in this survey, we target uh, the total uh, population of Peking uh, graduates uh, on that year. And in that year, there's a total number of uh, 3,074 3, students uh, graduate in that year. And we sent an email to all those students. And finally, we succeed a uh, response from 1,417 uh, students. So it means that the final response rate was uh, high. Uh, it was the response rate was uh, 46%. Uh, so I think, and also we compare the uh, the sample with the population of the PKU uh, graduates, and the sample was quite uh, representative. So yeah. Uh, so, okay. And also we compare the sample with the population of the country. Um, we use the uh, cartography of the social class, uh, which was developed by Lu Xieyi, a uh, famous uh, sociologist uh, working in the Chinese uh, social science academy. And according to the category, we can see that our, our sample uh, was very well represented in upper uh, and middle uh, class. For example, we can see that uh, in the survey, uh, more than 15% of our students come from leading uh, categories and government 
for officers in manager roles and uh, means that the uh, parents, the mothers or father are working in government or in uh, very big uh, national forms, uh, very high level uh, location. Also, 32% uh, of them, uh, their parents are professionals, for example, university teachers, lawyers, and other kinds of uh, professional uh, uh, staff. So it means that uh, these uh, students are very uh, over represented in uh, upper class and middle class. Next slide. And this is our basic regulation model uh, we started. And in our survey, we uh, collect uh, many uh, information of the students, uh, and this made our uh, survey very, uh, how to say, very well informed. For example, we asked their uh, economic uh, capital. We asked how how they feel uh, their family income, if they're wealthy or not, uh, how much. And also we have the information of the students' uh, father's educational level, and also their father's and mother's uh, vocation. Also uh, very important, we have the GPA of those students. Uh, it means that we know their academic performance. I think uh, uh, so in the model one, we just uh, include uh, the economic capital and also the social background of the students. And, and we can see that, we can see that the economic uh, capital is uh, extremely significant. Uh, and uh, yes, and also uh, fathers' uh, profess, uh, profession is also uh, important. That's the model one, we can see that. And in the model two, we control, we add a uh, geography origin of the students. For example, we know that in China, the, where the student come from is very important. If the student will come from the city, urban, uh, they will go to very uh, schools with high quality education. If they are from rural uh, areas, it means that they are, uh, they, they can't, uh, it's very uh, difficult for them to get access to high quality education. So we can see that uh, geography origin is also very important uh, in the model two, and um, and can, and also the economy and the uh, sociology economy status is also important. In the model three, we add another level, the gender. The gender is, I think, that's quite uh, uh, surprising. The result we can see that the uh, gender female students are not in a disadvantaged position compared to um, male uh, students. Because uh, what's the reason? Because it's the uh, year is doing a lot of research about the uh, uh, women in China, especially the uh, how to rank it, uh, one child generation. Because a lot of girls are from urban or from cities. Many of them are from wealthy families. So, because the only one kid in the family, the parents invest a lot in girls' education. So that's why the girls did not, uh, was not in a disadvantaged position uh, in learning abroad opportunities. It's different from existing literature, I think. And the models four, we add another uh, very key variable, that's the GPA, it means the achievement of the uh, to uh, pick your students. And it's, it's very surprising that even controlling the GPA, economic capital and the uh, sociology, uh, socioeconomic status are, are keeping a significant effect. We can see that it's, it's, it's important, it's uh, yeah, significant. So it, I think it's quite surprising because in, in PKU, we, we all know that the students, uh, uh, it's very uh, difficult for students with uh, poor academic achievement to 
get a, a learning abroad opportunities. But we can see that even control the GPA, the economy is also extremely important. Finally, the model five, we add uh, another uh, variable that's the prized uh, experience. It means that if they have international learning experience uh, during the college years or before college, and we can see that uh, is, is, this variable is also uh, significant. But even after controlling these uh, two variables, economy also play a very important role. And also father's educational level is important, but uh, the vocation, the father's vocation is not uh, important uh, after controlling education level and economic capital. So according to the finding, I think it's the very surprising results that economy play so important role in uh, accepts to learning abroad uh, opportunities. That's, uh, I think that's uh, different from my expectation because, it, yeah, because we know that uh, a lot of students uh, get a flat fellowship. If they go to the United States, uh, many of them can guarantee uh, a full uh, fellowship, which will pay that tuition. But why is economy? We will still play, uh, play a so important world. I think the reason is that many students do not uh, go to the PhD program, they go to the master program. And master program, uh, uh, United States or UK is, is no different. They all charge very high tuitions. I, I remember that I, I interviewed one student uh, from our school and he applied for a top uh, business uh, program in in uh, Northwestern University in the United States. And the tuition fee, I think, was more than $100,000 US dollars. It's, it's, it's extremely high. So that's, uh, I think that's the reason. Next slide. Yeah, I think I finished here. Okay. Um, your turn, um, yeah, your turn now, yeah. So I think Wen Ching um, highlighted the statistical findings from our survey study, and in particular, he highlighted this kind of a where, where we compare the entry level and exit level, so students' background when they enter the Peking U and when they exit Peking U in terms of study abroad in pensions, and we found economic capital played a very important role, and um, the, the proportion of students studying abroad more likely to be from the, the party elite family or from corporation or elite. So economic capital, and in China, it's very difficult to distinguish, distinguish you know, political elites and the corporation elites. And so the Wenjing just highlights as a very important finding of economic capital, which kind of used as extra gain to find out challenges from less well-off families and those from professional um, families without adequate economic uh, resources. And the second part to follow up because I was uh, survey study had a lot of unfinished stories, so we wanted to explore further by uh, following up with a um, a qualitative uh, research design. So the three components in our qualitative data: thirty-three in-depth in individual interviews. One month documentation of what we call as a poster culture in an undergraduate student um, hall, and ob observational data from 11 study abroad events um, advertised in this poster and relevant uh, study abroad um, seminars. So we I just want to briefly talk about how we did this interviews. Interviews, we in, uh, interviewed a student at least uh, twice and semi-structured. Interview last around uh, an hour and a half or to two, hour, two hours or record it with student consent and all students' identity and uh, the fields of studies were anonymized. Uh, we use pseudonyms and codes. Um, our research assistant Huang Ying spent a whole month documenting and uh, taking photographs of all the posters putting this undergraduate 
accommodation hall. We choose this particular hall because uh, all uh, six levels, all um, undergraduate students. So they're very kind of exposed to this kind of on-campus poster culture. And she took a total um, uh, 192 photographs captured 578 posters and of which 507 included can categorize can be categorized as study abroad seminars or networking or meet and greet events subsequently we attended two events advertised through this poster and went to another nine relevant events to, to find out the, what we call the, the campus culture of study abroad. So I, the first finding from a quality from the three sets of quality data is it called, what we call educational um, emulation. We want to emphasize the students who express strong desire to study abroad or very keen, already had plans, already had offers to study abroad, already pre-recorded their aspirations before they come to Peking U. So that's just, uh, you know, this, this finding is very important because it, you know, really pushes to think about the whole hierarchical culture, uh, how, how hierarchical nature of China's schooling system particularly those students from national elite schools, Beijing Sijong and this kind of a really national competitive elite schools. So their aspirations recorded and they mentioned that they had the seminars, events, even in high school, when they met their study sisters, Xue Ge, Xue Jie, who already were PhD students in a particularly in Ivy League universities. And study abroad was used a way to increase their competitiveness, increase their advantages uh, uh, in relation to other picking you uh, graduates through the narratives of authenticating merits, establishing unit elite networks, and achieving unique cultural capital, and they called it Goju. I just want to give a few examples and of how they use uh, study abroad as a, a very important way to fend off challenges. So uh, Meng Gang Xu, uh, Xu, Xu, Xu Meng Gang is a 22 year old undergraduate from information technology, shared his uneasiness with those who were not, not picking undergraduates but ob obtained uh, postgraduate degrees from his own department. And in his words, they are inferior. They failed at Gaokao, but they managed to find their way to the graduate school, which is not as competitive as the Gaokao, and what an insult to us. So for the Peking U undergraduates, probably very similar to this in Oxford and Cambridge, undergraduate degrees are kind of, uh, had a, they play the gold, golden card, the, uh, the value of their degree. So the Gaokao is the ultimate selection of merits, those who bypass Gaokao were not real talents. So the, another um, very interesting uh, story from our interview is called A True Talent Goes to the Ivy League. So Zhou Mengli, a 19-year-old undergraduate and recipient of full scholarship from Ivy League University, purposefully distinguished himself from non-scholarship students by emphasizing his scholarship status and he said many mediocre go to study abroad in reputable university top 10 times higher education uh, because they, they have very rich studies, can buy their degrees all the way up abroad. But only Ivy League provides scholarships, which means it's merit based selection. Um, I would say elites only come from the Gaokao route or the Ivy League. So apart from you know, the Peking undergraduates um, purposefully fend off challenges and de developing a new narrative of being elite, being distinct. We also need to see the other side of the story. Distinction needs recognition, needs consensus over those challenges. So where did this consensus come from? And how did it reach this consensus? How did they reach this kind of acceptance of Ivy League going to US, a scholarship holder 
more more elite than rest of of this. So we need to look at the kind of a, the mechanism authoring this particular na narrative, what we call the co-authors of di distinction at the institutional level. So we have a study abroad agents, we have alumni networks, so we have student organization, they all played in a role and their activities coordinated in such a way to justify a study abroad culture, particularly giving recognition to a certain type of a study abroad options. So this is the poster culture on, on campus. So this is the, the photos taken by Huang Ying um, in a student hall. So this is just a, a kind of a snapshot of what we documented during um, our field work. So it's, it's not, uh, probably it's not very clear. You cannot see um, the words. And um, there's an advertisement for the events and seminars relating to study abroad or meet and greet with scholarship holders, um, uh, this event uh, in Peking U. And I also want to, uh, we, we also found that Peking U alumni actually had a uh, very interesting role as, um, sorry, am I running out of time? Just quickly wrap up, as double agents. So the aspirational models, role models for undergraduate students who aspire uh, to study abroad, However, they're also business partners with study abroad agents. Their unique picking your identity give them advantages and legitimacy to be event speakers, to be private paid consultant. Um, and most interviewees acknowledge picking your alumni signal elite status and they are more trustworthy. Now let's talk about study abroad agents. And half of our interviewees uh, confirmed the use or partly used the package service provided by study abroad uh, agents, including personalized selection of fields of study application and uh, rec you know, sample of uh, personal statements, recommendation letters, application form, and sometimes ghost writing their personal statement, depends on how much you are willing to pay, you're able to pay. And the fees run from 60,000 RMB to 80,000 RMB, more than twice as much of average household disposable income in China in 2019. Um, the secret weapon, again, by study abroad agent is picking your old Qinghua alumni enrolled in the Ivy League PhD programs. The, the private consult, consultant covers uh, analyze the employability to a certain degree, identifying particular fields of study, and I mentioned earlier, ghostwriting personal uh, statements. But uh, we also need to think about why the study broad agents invested so much resources in this particular university. Is it cost benefit? You know, what is outcome of investing so much energy networking in picking you. It's because the agent can also explore this kind of very unique narrative of, of distinction and the purposefully offering the second best pathways to distinction for those excluded in this narrative of distinction, for instance. Um, the tapping to this uh, huge market of graduates from non-STEM subjects or those GPA not uh, high enough, and they offer the second best pathways, in other words, UK universities. And they uh, turn into a very business, attractive business strategy to attract, to advertise UK university as a, you know, almost elite, uh, you know, distinction pathway and encourage them to apply for university uh, to, to, to the UK um, degrees. And this, this student said, I did not prepare for my exam properly. My English was also poor, but the agent advised me to go to UK because it's uh, much easier. 
So I tried and I got accepted to this university anonymized. It's not Oxbridge, but it's very prestigious. So, so the kind of the, their business strategy is to, to, to kind of position UK as the second best pathway to distinction and help them to enroll as many clients as possible. Um, so I'm aware of the time limit, so I'm just going to wrap up. So what we call we frame our research as the kind of building three halos. It's very difficult to uh, to 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 finalize to you know share all the findings in thirty minutes. So we call it about three halos. We um, the three halos means elite schools. P picking you and RV League scholarship holders is a process gradually narrowing the circle of us and excluding aspirational others, fend off of challenges. And this individual level of uh, distinction um, authoring is coordinated with a collective consensus organizational intermediaries seeking justify uh, recognizing and misrecognizing certain uh, study broad opportunities. And we also uh, highlighted the complexity of the Peking Yu elites and their identities. And they're both possessors and the challenges of distinction. The main, uh, in our original research, we said that the main beneficiaries were the study abroad agents, um, uh, the study abroad industry, but because of the recent crackdown and the you know, the private tutoring companies will have a knockdown impact on their activities on a uh, university campus in future. Okay, that's all. And thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yes, please. That would be brilliant to you. Thank you very much. That, that was fascinating and a really um, sort of rich, complicated situation um, of various forms of capital being um, de deployed and invested. And I was thinking about the way in which these Peking students are actually um, f turning full circle. They're, they're managing to turn their cultural capital, having studied abroad back into economic capital by, by making some money out of being agents for others. So that, that was very rich and, and interesting. And I think um, the, 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 I have a number of questions and um, I'm, but I'm, I'm, my job is not to, not to fire off immediately. So I'm gonna ask Ying Yang to start, please. Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. It is really, really thought provoking. Thank you. Um, my research is looking at the role of education agents in the marketized international higher education sector. And your presentation mentioned a bit around that. So I really want to know, based on your initial impression of the interviews, do you think universe, uh, students from Peking University are influenced by agents' advice? If so, to what extent? Because as I know a lot, students from Peking University um, possessed uh, relatively advantageous um, resources related to overseas education or opportunities to go abroad because there are so many programs in terms of um, exchange programs or uh, just summer visit. So I do want to know based on much knowledge of overseas education agent, uh, overseas education, how to what level, uh, how much um, do the students from packing universities um, take agents advice? Um, it's a really good question to really, because uh, uh, you mentioned Peking University students had really distinctive advantages already. So the agents working in a, it does, uh, in, uh, you know, industry probably will find a lot of opticals when they go to Peking U. They cannot, the, the, the agents, what we call the, the market agents, uh, in the industry agents might not survive in the Peking U. They, they only become successful when they team up with Peking U alumni, so the scholarship holders. So they provide this kind of, uh, uh, you know, role models and also advice for students. So in another way to put it, the agents become successful only they pick back on Peking U alumni in Peking University. So this might not be representative in other campuses. 
So, um, because our research only look at how this kind of language of a distinction was produced and written. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, can I have, can I have, <laughs> yes, yes, I have another yeah. question, sorry. Um, um, given characteristics of students from packing you, they are in terms of academic abilities, it seems they are quite, they are a kind of a competitive applicant in application games. Hmm. Do you think they need agents assistance to make them more distinguished hmm. in the yeah. application games? So in some of the interviews we found the students, they are they already had, uh, they take all the boxes, the, it's, it's, they have no problems. So they hired agents because they want to ice, outsource certain activities, such as um, doing the forms, uh, sorting out accommodations, and uh, orders of what they call the leg work. So they could concentrate on getting that examination done. So the, even they had very, very good GPA results, even they have very good academic record, but they still need to pass the exams, such as um, ours exams, if they want to come to the UK and they have to do uh, other uh, tests in the US. So they want to prioritize their energy and examination. So they still hire agents to do what they call the lab work. Thank you very much. We help you to build your new business strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, Thanks I mean, it's, so it's, <laughs> yes, it's, it's fascinating because, as you say, you, you, as as Yingyang says, you know, you'd expect these people to be highly motivated and 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 very much able to read the situation. But of course, every expert, every bit of expertise helps, I guess, in in what's perceived as a really competitive environment. Yeah, we also want to emphasize, you know, even Peking you know, uh, students, they still feel anxious because they are, they constantly see, you know, students from uh, other universities going to abroad, studying in the UCL, for instance, study in you know, LSE, and uh, whether the PQU degree is good enough, or they, they have this kind of uh, anxiety. That's why they want to um, to to uh, to study abroad. But the 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 purposefully uh, developed this narrative called you know very very exclusive uh, language of distinction. You have to had the elite school, and you have to have picking your Tsinghua University. I'm going to so you know American University anonymized. I'm not going to socialize with everyone. I'm only going to socialize with PQU Tsinghua graduates. So you can see they have this kind of very interesting kind of narrative uh, bubbling up and to give them certain kind of, you know, prestige edge than other student challenges. Thank you. I can see you have to invest in your own brand. That's very interesting. <laughs> Joshua, please come forward. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for that uh, presentation. Uh, my name is Joshua. I'm a Singaporean. Uh, I actually graduated from King's. So uh, <laughs> that was. Is, is oh, I always like student from King's. <laughs> um, Very good university. Yeah. My re my research. Um, oh yeah, my research right now is on the geographies of education, especially urban education. Um, I just have uh, two questions. So the first one is. There's a lot of discussion about widening uh, socioeconomic inequalities across geographic regions in China. And you mentioned this key phrase, uh, urban coastal regions. Uh, does the constant flows of elite study abroad students from urban coastal regions in China further widen these socioeconomic inequalities across geographical borders? Um, and my second question is, for the case of Peking University, uh, just to challenge a bit, uh, to what extent will you call the outflow of students a study abroad culture as compared to an urban cosmopolitan culture as seen across cities like London and Singapore? Uh, because you spoke about the influence of Peking University um, uh, on student aspirations to study abroad. So just wanted to hear about how living in the city of Beijing might also influence their study abroad aspirations. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for your question. I will start, then I will ask Wen Qing to add. Is that okay? So the, the first question, absolutely. So the Chinese face is at a crossroad of uh, going towards more 
kind of competitive and more, uh, you know, kind of a, almost like a toxic competitiveness driven culture and or building a fairer or more egalitarian society. That's why the recent whole social policy, specifically you, you have seen recent, uh, uh, you know, policy change such as, uh, you know, completely crack down the private uh, tutoring sector and, you know, taming the really powerful uh, uh, digital uh, uh, enterprises uh, send a really strong signal from the government uh, to, to, to commit to a, a kind of a welfare kind of model of development. Uh, it's probably too early to say, but having said that, yes, the, the study brought culture and this kind of uh, elite distinction making further kind of distance that we kind of create a social distance between rural students, between metropolitan student, students and those from non-metropolitan areas, particularly from rural areas. And in our narrative, and it's very interesting, they use the, uh, the word uh, to be, to by elite students to describe certain stu students. It's kind of, a, it's called a countryside turtle. So you can, see how elites view uh, you know the the the, the rural residents and students from rural areas so there's a lot of kind of a um you know kind of a culture of it is it's very uh how can i put it it's very stratified and it also kind of had a huge impact on those uh, from rural areas um, so I, I think absolutely you, you ask a really good question. And the second uh, is about living in the cities. Uh, absolutely. Um, so the reason we decided to do an observation to capture the campus culture with a visual image is to allow us to have a, a really concrete understanding of where did culture come from? Where did this narrative come from? The daily exposure to you know, study broad culture actually make a huge impact on um, on students' um, aspirations. And some student uh, mentioned, uh, when I come to PU, I didn't really know uh, I should study abroad, but you know, I constantly uh, being exposed to those kind of events, meet and greet, and uh, I met those very interesting people from you know who are studying uh, uh, you know master PhD in. Uh, US it's all very interesting so that really had a huge impact on their um, aspirations and a study broad plan so absolutely uh, Wenqi do you have anything to add? To we'll add something about the city about the importance of the city yes I think you are quite right um, Beijing uh, because we also have some uh, in similar projects we also interview uh, elite students from Xi'an and, and from, from Haibin, uh, from the west of the China. And we can see that compared to uh, students in the east, uh, the students from the west of China, then I think their, uh, their aspiration to go abroad is much lower compared to students in east cities. Uh, Beijing is quite uh, international uh, is especially academically. I think before the COVID-19, lots of uh, professors from foreign countries uh, come to Beijing because Beijing is uh, have a lot of uh, quite uh, famous universities. But students in Beijing, they can uh, listen to lectures from international professors. I think in some of our case, the students told us that uh, the one reason why they chose to start, uh, study abroad was that uh, and when they, they listened to a lecture from international faculty members and um, international visiting professors, that uh, uh, that's one of the reasons why they chose to learn abroad because they this lecture may be uh, motivate their academic profession and they have some experience of what uh, academy is. Um, yes, that's. That's quite important. City is quite important. Yes, I think you are right. Yes, just add some information to yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I didn't think about how the congregation of international professors would further spur students on in the city. So thank you so much for, for uh, those insights. They're really interesting. You're welcome.
the, the, thank you, Joshua. I mean, were, interestingly, I think, as you say, that, that if it becomes an expectation almost that that everyone did, goes to study abroad, then um, almost what you're getting is a, a sort of self, as you described, a culture that that self reproduces. Um, and and but you're talking to people within that culture, so so almost inevitably you're going to hear that back from them. I guess my question for you just is. Um, are, are there, are, are, is it as stable as it might seem if there are questions about um, the, the sort of the way in which possibly study abroad agencies might might be told not, not to carry on doing that work? You know, if there's been crackdowns in other forms of educational tutoring, if they're, if they're post COVID, there's been a change. So, you, so Wenchen, you, you, in your last slide, your last box, you hinted at possible recent changes. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Uh, Winching, do you want to share your a uh, recent research about student study abroad intentions and? Okay, yeah. Uh, COVID nineteen, the, the impact of COVID nineteen, um, because also of the latest the changes, also you know a, a yeah. sense of the, the the sort of questions about Peking University's own independence and autonomy as well. Uh... I think uh, last year there's not a big change uh, okay. of study abroad phenomenon, but this year is still to, uh, still to be seen. Um, because last year a lot of students had already made decision uh, to study abroad before COVID nineteen, they have no choice. They have to uh, continue their aspiration to, and plan. But this year they have more options. They have more choices. They can stay in China and also um, maybe I think there's some changes, uh, especially in according to statistics of the Tsinghua University um, last year. I think the percentage of students going abroad is uh, cut down by 50 percent in, in the Tsinghua University, but in PQU, uh, no change. So that's quite the difference between these two universities. It's very interesting to know more about uh, the reason behind that. Yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Yeah, that would be fascinating to learn more about. But I, I mustn't ask any more questions because we have lots of people who want to ask questions. So, Marta, um, perhaps you could come in, please, and then um, Si Ching and then Kundai. Seeing you, so it seems. <laughs> The connection seems right. I've typed my question. Thank you very much for the present. Um. So Marta has given me her question in case the connection doesn't come back. Sh shall I shall I ask her question and then if she can get in, she can join in the conversation. So she, the first question she asked was, are there any any trends in relation to particular disciplines in recent years? So um, are students changing in, in this search for distinction? Are they changing the, the sorts of fields they're applying for? Um, such as a move towards, towards life sciences, biotech. I, I guess what's interesting here is, and perhaps you would take a bit more about this, Peking University is, is traditionally very strong in the social sciences and humanities, isn't it? So, and then Tsinghua is probably more of a science-led university, is that fair? Which yes, uh, PKU is uh, strong in humanities and social science, but uh, PKU is also very strong in natural science, especially okay. in mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Okay. Uh, for example, in the Department of Chemistry, uh, before COVID-19, I think about 50% of the BA degrees holders will go abroad. Okay. Uh, many of them go to Revital University, Harvard, Princeton, and Berkeley and also Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. PK is also very strong in natural science. And, the, and Tsinghua is very strong in engineering and also strong in natural science. Yeah, that's the, and also the culture different uh, between these two universities is different. Uh, yes, maybe that's the institutional culture play a role here. Yeah, it's yet to be known. Yeah, I just want to follow up with uh, what Masa, Marta, is it Marta? <laughs> Sorry if I pronounce your name correctly. So you ask about the trends in terms of selections of fields of study. So that's a really excellent question 
So we need to look at the picking your students, the entry level and the exe level uh, abroad. So the entry level, they're affected by the government, the flagship programs, for instance, um, you know, the life science, uh, the um, biotechnology, information technology technology and a lot of STEM subjects were set by the government as flagship programs. So that it already affected the student selection during the Gaokao, during their entry to picking, picking you. So, and the government, when we look at the government flagship programs is also, and this uh, STEM subjects in a way allied with some really strong field, fields of study in the RB League. For instance, Stanford and other, you know, uh, university strong information technology or biotechnology. So the student who actually, um, the one student we, in, uh, we interviewed, gave us really a, a interesting example, and he said, um, "I'm not worried about, uh, uh, you know, scholarship because um, my field, it's a, I think it's a biotechnology, was already very competitive during the Gaokao." And all my, the, what they call it, the previous uh, classmate, uh, the, the, the mates from the same department, very likely to get a scholarship to go to US to do a PhD after uh, undergraduate. So he said this kind of, um, um, it's kind of privilege already built up during their entry at the Peking U that would help their transition to study abroad as a scholarship holder. So that's a really distinctive uh, field. So uh, to just the long story short, STEM still uh, much more prestigious than social sciences and humanities. But on the other hand, I'm very po positive they cannot survive without us. So <laughs> it should be, you know, they cannot make sense if we don't, you know, explain things clearly to them. So <laughs> I don't know if that answered the question, Marta. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I cannot connect properly. Don't worry, don't worry. Thank you for your question. Okay, so I'm aware we're running out of time. Um, so I'm gonna ask for two or three questions um, together and then we'll give you a last chance to respond, Yiliu and Wenqin. Perhaps, um, first of all, um, I could ask Kundai to come out and um, ask a question, please. And um, can I you there? Um, yeah. I think he already typed uh, his okay. question in the yeah, yes. chat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you respond to what Kun, Dr. Dai's question is on the right? Oh, I, I haven't seen it. Okay. The... okay, so I'll, I'll read, the, read the question out. So it's asking about the, the chat framework. The, yeah. Oh, you talk about, okay, I, I saw your question now. You ask about the theoretical uh, concept to frame the study, whether we could um, uh, uh, provide a new theoretical lens. So um, yes, it's a really good question. We constantly kind of in the, um, in a kind of a long journey of discovering ourselves, you know, as a Chinese scholar, as scholar from a very different context, how we, use the theories primarily built produced from western context we i talk about the uh the bodies uh cultural capital and distinction making and uh the research uh uh you know emulation and uh recognition i think they are really you know helpful conceptual kind of a scaffolding for us to do research to make sense of our data but having said that, we also need to recognize how can we explain this, you know, uh, this almost obsession of a meritocracy and this obsession with, um, you know, uh, credentials and uh, the degrees by Chinese elites. You know, how can we uh, develop a new theoretical framework that, you know, become an umbrella that could help us to explain the, the merit-based selection, the attraction merit-based selection uh, through a cultural capital uh, framework and through the recognition, the emulation and uh, recognition, misrecognition kind of a, um, perspective. 
So hopefully uh, our research will make a, a small contribution to push the to, to push the theoretical boundaries, but uh, we're still working on it. We can't, you know, we can't promise a big sea change in Nobel Prize winning theory, but uh, every small step matters. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so um, two last questions. I'm gonna read out um, one of them um, from Ahmed Maltani, and he asks about um, the, way, the role of, of um, Western universities in um, in supporting the consultants and the agents, and whether whether they whether they are partly trying to sustain their intellectual dominance. That's an interesting question. So the perspective really more of a from from the perspective of universities in the US. And and then um, Si Ching, you you'd like to come forward and ask a question, please. Myself. Uh, again, thanks very much for the brilliant insights from your study. One of the research findings is that the main beneficiaries are study abroad agents who can make probably huge uh, profits of the sort of industry. So I'm, I'm just wondering what role the receiving institutions and um, the Ivy Leagues in the US or Russell Group Universities in the UK may play. Did students, um, especially those who've probably already um, experienced the study life abroad ever talk about their views on those elite universities outside of China and um, have their views change a little bit compared with when they were still in PKU. So that's that's just my, um, a quick question. <laughs> Thanks. Great, great, thanks. Thanks, Yijing. And then um, that's sort of those two linked together. So one just yeah. time for one last question from Jane. Jane Ding, can you come forward? Hi, could you hear me? Hi, yes, Jane. Yeah. Uh, my question is actually due to the intention why students would like to study abroad, especially for these elite students who have already got their uh, undergraduate degree in Peking U. So that that's simply due to the attraction from Western universities or um, some competition, you know, in China, we got fierce competition uh, if they want to further their study or um, perhaps they better treatment when they return. So some, mo do you got any idea about the motivation for study, for students study abroad? Okay, great, great question. And um, what, what, why people go and um, what, what their motivations are. So you have two minutes really to respond. Thank you very much. Okay. Hopefully, I can. Um, I, I, I would have a go. That Wen Qing can just jump in. So this, this two questions really are good about the, in the role of Western universities in kind of a, you know underwriting this whole prestige narrative. So in in, in our data, we we could not see a direct link between, for instance, the Ivy League University or Oxford, Cambridge, uh, the actively in, uh, creating this kind of, you know, uh, the prestige uh, uh, role on picking your campus. But having said that, um, I think one of the respondents really right um, about the Xue Ge the, the scholarship holders and those students who, at the time of the interview, who are already PhD holders, uh, scholarship holders, or they were PhD students, or they, were, they already studied in Ivy League, and they played a very important role in um, articulating a, 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 a story, and in a way, in a, in, in a most positive, on the most positive light of study abroad. Okay. Um, and they did not share this specific detail of the story. The, they had a private consultancy with Xue Ge Xue Ji, but in the meet and greet events, they introduced the, you know, the facilities, the labs uh, in this Ivy League universities, and they talk about the perks, we call it the perks related with study abroad. Um, and one, um, so we haven't seen this kind of a direct, recolonization kind of intention from Western universities. Um, but what we want to ask a question, are Chinese students really need to be recolonized? 
um, you know, by aligning their aspirations with particularly Western University, US-led Ivy League, Oxbridge, um, the piggyback on this, uh, what we call it, prestige hierarchy to distance themselves from Chinese university instead of challenging these already very hierarchical, very uh, kind of reproduction of a colonial order. So that's a big question to all of you. Why Chinese students or Chinese elites unwillingly to challenge the colonial, what we call the, the residue of the colonial order? So that question I have no answer to, but hopefully we can all uh, <laughs> pay some attention in the future in our research. And then the, the, the one last question about why, elite, what are the motivations for elites to study abroad? A range of elites captured by previous uh, scholarship in terms of their, um, I, I, I talk a lot about, uh, you know, to make their, themselves more attractive uh, in terms of a job market, to make them, uh, the, the one word phrase really captured the motivation is called ren um ren shen, ren uh, is that one thing did i did i trans, did i remember it correctly yeah. So the constant that is kind of uh, pulling up the ladder to make them more competitive, sometimes without exact concrete purpose of, uh, of being more competitive. So we often are, uh, you know, use this kind of rational, uh, kind of uh, the, the rational uh, theory to analyze people's motivation. And sometimes they're not very rational. They just want to be more competitive. And also a lot of students, there is no one way to explain the motivation. So there are a lot of motivation for, for the, the rates of return of their degree. Motivation in terms of building good, a very unique cultural capital study in the life style experiences and also particular networking experiences. So networking is very important for picking your elites. So these are all important. Uh, you know, motivations, justification for them to seek study abroad um, opportunities. I hope that answers the question. Great. Uh, we're gonna. We're running out of time. We've run over. Um, you asked some great questions. Thank you, audience. And this, the question you posed back, Ilu, of you know why uh, why are students um, both being super rational and um, super sort of focused on their own careers, and what are the consequences of that for? a sort of recolonization or a, a neocolonization are really interesting. And as you say, there's more research needed. So, so thank you, you've been provocative. You've given us lots to think about. It's been a great presentation. Next um, webinar is on Thursday, um, Culture Clash and Identity University Merges in Russia. You can register as ever on our CG website um, and today's transcript and slides and um, the, the video will also be available tomorrow on our website. Thank you all for coming. And see you at our next CD webinar. Thank you to Renchen and Lilu. Thank you. Thank bye you, Dewey. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.